uh, about eight years old, I sang in the choir of the English church in Copenhagen. My father and father's father had a big boys' school called Major School, oh. and we had a very good English teacher, so the boy in the, the school spoke, spoke very good English. So uh, the boys were used for the English church choir, mm -hmm. and I sang there also. That was my first the singing, very first. of course. Yeah. There was a lot of singing in my home, but but that was that was because I loved to sing. Yes. What was the very first role you ever sang? My very first role, when I still was not engaged to any opera, was in an opera school where I worked in Denmark. And uh, the, uh, the was performing the marriage of Figaro. And I sang the gardener, the, the gardener in Figaro. That was my, my very first opera singing. And then later on, my first real opera debut, that was Silvio in Pagliacci. The As a baritone. The baritone. Yeah. I was first baritone for a long time, eight years. Uh, in those early years, was Wagner one of your goals? No, not Wagner was not my uh, goal because I didn't know much about him to start with. I was interested in the Italian singing, uh, in the baritone roles. But as my voice developed up, in the register, and I still had the dark quality of the high notes a uh, heroic Wagner tenor should have. For that. Uh, then, uh, of course, I was guided that way because uh, it was nature who guided me the way, and I don't regret it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Your interpretations of Wagner's heroes are monumental today. Uh, can you tell our listeners how you prepared your roles and what you did to go about learning them? When you get a part, a role, then you, of course, first let somebody play it through for you, the music and so on, and you follow the words, and you just see if you think that it is a part for you in the way of how high it goes or how low it goes, and then uh, when you then start with it, then you should do learn your words. The words print themselves in your brain together with the music. Like see, when you sing sometimes a song, if you cannot remember the words, sometimes when you then repeat the music, the words come back to you. Yeah, that's right. And so it is with the with the uh, uh, learning of a part. It is on tape in your brain, and then of course you have to live the part the way you produce it to the audience. If you just sing and there is no feeling back of your words or no acting in what you are doing, no expression in your face or in anything, well, of course, your audience will go to sleep quite nicely. <laughs> you had a rather diverse repertoire. Uh, surely amongst these works that you sang, you had a favorite. My favorite role is, of course, Tristan. And I have sung... 230 Tristans in my life. So that is that anyhow. Many. That's something. Yes. I killed a lot of his soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe some conductors too. <laughs> he may have got some nervous breakdown, I don't know. <laughs> and I have sung with some very wonderful soldiers. Did you ever want to do a role but never got the chance to do it? There's always a lot of roles you would like to do. You cannot do everything. No. And you have then to specialize about the things you're doing because 
you have an engagement enough with them, you can't sing every day. That's right. But uh, there are interesting parts. I, I, I would have loved to have, have sung uh, Carmen, you see. You say. In Carmen, and uh, well, but I sang a lot of Italian opera, but not over here, of course. Yes. Well, we just mentioned some of your leading ladies. Let's talk about some of these ladies for a few minutes. I have sung with so many different ladies, leading and not leading. <laughs> some of them are still alive. Yes. Two of them, my very dear friends, is one is Lotte Lehmann, with whom I have sung, I don't know how many Valkyries and Lone Greens and Tannhäusers and everything. We are very great friends. She is a nice old lady, and I hope that an, uh, I'm a nice old man. <laughs> but uh, we are already all very great friends from that time. And then I have another great friend, one of my very first Isolders, that is Frida Leider, who now lives in Berlin. And uh, I was just over and visiting her this summer, and uh, she is a wonderful woman also. Then a lot of them know, I know angels sitting on a little sky singing, but uh, I have had many good friends. Also, I would like to mention uh, a name like uh, uh, Kirsten Flachstadt, yes. with whom I sang very much and was also one of the great assaults. She was not so warm as, as uh, uh, Lotte and Frieda Leider. But her singing and technique in singing was magnificent. It seems today that a lot of the conductors get as much applause, and in some cases more, than some of the singers that they're working with. I wonder how you feel about that. I cannot see why a conductor, if he is a good conductor, should not have uh, some uh, applause. I don't think that it is necessary that he has his applause down in the orchestra pit and also up on the stage. What the audience want to applaud, that is up to them. And uh, I think that every artist is thankful for uh, any sort of applause they get, yeah. as long as they don't throw things at them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. As long as we're talking about conductors, tell me a little bit of your work with the great maestro Toscanini. Yeah, I have worked a lot with Arthur Toscanini at all. He was one of the greatest conductors there ever have been, but he was a very despotic one. He was very, very hard. With his men in the orchestra, as well as with his artists, but of course, you learned terrific discipline from yeah. him. And uh, God helped you if you didn't know your parts, if you sang anything wrong. Uh, he would follow you on the stage. But when then the intermission come, you'll be glad that you were alive for the next act. <laughs> but uh, we came very well out of it together that we didn't uh, sing so much in concert together was uh, he said to me one day, Lois, why, why are you so expensive? So I, say, uh, I said, but because you cost too much as conductor. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> what about some of our new singers of today? I know very little about our new singers. I would hate to say anything bad or even good about any because I have no right to do it because I don't know enough. I only wish that we have some very good ones and that they are going to make great career and uh, I think that that is the most important for any one of them. Yes, it is. And uh, I hope that they will get a little better chance in our country uh, that we will wake up a little better to know that we have to support our art in America. Uh, so many of our young artists have to go to Europe or other countries 
to get the schooling. We have nowhere here where they can really get a good schooling like they can in Europe. I hope that when we now get a new manager in the Metropolitan, I've been waiting for, for <laughs> some years, then I hope that uh, he will, uh, as a Scandinavian of blood, he will understand that uh, a lot of things come uh, when the young singers have the right guidance when they start their work. Yes. And that is where we have been in need. Nobody took any notice and care of anybody who was taken uh, to the uh, roster of the Metropolitan Opera. They were taken in, they got a thousand dollars for a season and nobody worked with them, nothing happened. So uh, that is a sort of, of, of ruining them instead of helping them. I really hope that there is more possibilities now coming for the young singers of America. I don't believe that opera is something who is dying. I believe that opera is still living. I only think who makes it uh, so uh, difficult to produce is that an opera needs an orchestra, singers, and ballet and chorus and the prices and the salaries for all these people should be carried by what the opera uh, people pay for the tickets. That is not right. The government ought to give so and so much money to let the opera and the good music live and not all that trash you hear today when you open right. for your radio. Culture of good music will keep and help America keep America a country of freedom and beauty and of love to the country. Too many of our young people do not deserve to be called American because they are not doing what they should as an American. Mm -hmm. And some of the fault of that is that America somewhere also in some ways are not doing what they should for the young ones. Mm -hmm. I think that I we had to learn a little, but I think that you shall walk along the road with song and music, not just uh, wackling with your little behind as they do now <laughs> and, and uh, all that sort of thing that that I don't like I don't think is very beautiful and I don't don't think there's much culture in it no. either. No, you're right. No.